and go live for everybody. Um, good morning, everybody, for everybody who has tuned in for this welcome session of the Ultrafast X ray Summer School. My name is uh, Thomas Wolf, and I'm uh, the lead organizer of the summer school. And additionally, I'm a staff scientist here at Stanford Pulse Institute um, at Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. Um, I'm gonna show a few slides. So I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see that? Yes. So first of all, I want to thank all of uh, the companies and organizations who have given um, support to the summer school, especially the US Department of Energy, Office of Science and the uh, Moore Foundation who were really generous um, to us. Um, the summer school is an annual program held alternative, uh, alternatingly between Stanford Pulse Institute and um, Center for Free Electron Science at DAISY in Hamburg. And therefore, um, I'm not only welcoming you on my behalf, but also on behalf of my co-chair from CFAIR, Kartik Ayer, who is also on the call. We have four more guests here. Um, Chi Chen Kao, the uh, Slack lab director, Mike Dunn, the, uh, the director of the LCLS facility. Shita Singal, who probably most of you have exchanged emails with and uh, without her, um, nothing here would work. Um, and our first speaker is also already online, uh, Georgia Marguerite Tondo. Usually we hold the summer school um, as an in-person event, alternatingly either, either at Slack or Daisy. This year it's different due to the coronavirus outbreak, due to a really worldwide event. But I have to say um, the response from the community, from you and also for, for, from, the, from the lectures is also really worldwide. We never had so many participants and so much interest in the summer school. We have about 180 participants from over 24 countries. Please, um, uh, I apologize in advance if I missed any country. And so this is a really big response, which makes me um, actually quite hopeful that we can, can go out of this crisis a little bit better than we, we came in and that we can advance X-ray science in a very uh, global fashion. Um, to show you a little bit where we actually are, for that, I have to rota rotate the globe a little bit to, the, uh, to North America. We are in the US, we are in California in the San Francisco Bay Area. And you see here San Francisco and Berkeley might also be known to some of you. And we are here on the um, very south of the Bay Area, um, Slack and Stanford University. And if you zoom even farther in, then you can see that uh, the campuses of Stanford and Slack are actually separate. And you can already see this uh, long line on the Slack campus, which is the linear accelerator, which is feeding LCLS. So this is even farther zoomed in. And um, we have here again the LCLS Linux. We have the LCS Near Experimental Hall, where many experiments are happening, the LCS Far Experimental Hall. And we have uh, the UED facility, slightly separate from that. And um, the building 40 here on the campus, where most of the labs of the Stanford Pulse Institute is located. And um, with that, um, I want to hand over um, to our lab director, Chi Cheng Kao, to say a few words of welcome. Chi Cheng, thanks very much for um, um, tuning in and uh, speaking. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for the great introduction. Let me first welcome all the viewers from around the world uh, at this extraordinary time that we can uh, gather together. Actually, shows that you know we will uh, be able to overcome this 
pandemic and uh, in fact some of the science you'll be doing I think will lay the groundwork for future. Uh, let me first thanks also, uh, Thomas Shitao uh, and Kartik. I understand you know how hard it is to organize a meeting like this even under the normal circumstances and and this is even uh, uh, harder. Th thank you so much. Uh, for the attendees, I think uh, ultra fast science really with the uh, uh, commissioning of LCLS back in 2009, a little more than a decade ago, really reminded me, probably Giorgio can tell you more about how the synchrotron got, got started. The, the excitement uh, uh, we feel now is similar to the excitement that uh, I felt when I was a student and a, a po postdoc. Uh, the, 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 the things that we learned back then and then what you will learn uh, during this uh, summer school, it's just the beginning of what this field might be. I think you will be the one that eventually become the leader of the field, creating something that we have not even imagined today yet. All right, so so take uh, time to uh, uh, listen to all the great lectures you will hear uh, uh, during the school, and and uh, think about the ideas you might have. I think there's uh, uh, opportunity for you to learn how to write proposals. I, I think I still remember that one of the first ideas I have in Synchrotron, the thing I'm still doing today. So <laughs> don't don't uh, 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 think because you knew your idea is not important, right? I think this is the time for a new feel like this uh, is when new ideas are, are necessary. So a school like this, you bring the uh, people who have a lot of experience and people who have no experience together is where I think we'll uh, fermenting new I I ideas. Uh, now, I think Maidan can tell you more about what we're doing uh, laboratory has been shut down uh, since mid-March. Uh, we are bringing people back now. Uh, LCLS restart is, is, is our highest priority. And LCLS 2, uh, as some of you know, the construction pro pro project to uh, increase the red rate from 120 hertz to a megahertz is, is, is also uh, uh, restarted again. And we hope to... Uh, uh, deliver beam of the high rate beam uh, in another two years or so, right? So this really is an extremely exciting time uh, uh, for you to uh, uh, get in, get involved in this field, right? I think you will hear more from my, how things sits right, right now. Uh, so let, let me uh, end with welcoming you again. I hope you have a productive uh, 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 summer school uh, with us even online. And I wish uh, I can see you soon on Slack side uh, one of these days. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chi Cheng. Uh, then I want to hand right over to, to Mike Dunn. OK, thank you, Thomas. Um, so I'll, I'll show uh, uh, just two or three slides, uh, which I want to use really to uh, follow on from what Chi Chang said, you know, to reflect on you know, what an amazing time we're living in in this world of X-ray science. Um, so let me try and share the screen. Okay. You're able to see that? Yes. So, you know, as, as Chi Chang mentioned, you know, th this, is, this is a time uh, of uh, quite incredible uh, progress from, from the point of view of X-ray science. You know, the past decade or so, um, you know, since LCLS first turned on in uh, 2009, maybe just over 11 years ago now, it has really laid the groundwork of what this field uh, can be and should be. And just shown here as an example on the, the right hand side of uh, this chart, you know, plotting on uh, you know, quite a severe log scale, the peak X-ray brightness and the average X-ray brightness of uh, you know, traditional and maybe third generation synchrotrons, diffraction limited storage rings, and where we are in the X-ray free electron laser world, you know, which um, as, I'm, as I'm sure you know, you know, gives us an enhancement of about a billion times in peak brightness and you know, thousands of times, maybe 10,000 times, uh, in X-ray brightness as these new facilities, European XFEL, RCLS2 and RCLS2 high energy turn on over the next uh, few years. 
know, so our challenge is to be able to to harness that and uh, you know turn it to uh, all of the scientific uh, challenges that uh, that excite us. I, I think the thing that attracted me though to this field was not just you know this incredible leap in capability, uh, but the ability to tailor and tune uh, the sex ray pulse to quite a remarkable degree. You know, just shown here on this chart, you know, we see you know four examples. You know, on the on the top left, the ability to uh, to move the um, uh, uh, the undulator magnets dynamically to to tune not just the X-ray uh, wavelength but also its polarization from linear to circular or, or anywhere in between. You know, one of uh, the most exciting things from an AMO science point of view, as we've seen, is this ability to go from what was initially thought to be a pulse length uh, range of you know maybe tens to a few hundreds of femtoseconds, now down to a few hundred attoseconds, both in the soft X-ray domain and the hard X-ray domain, getting in this case, you know, 14 EV or so of coherent bandwidth in the hard X-ray domain, and maybe you know, six or so EV of coherent bandwidth in the in the soft X-ray domain. You know, really exciting uh, 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 potential there for, for driving a whole new era of X-ray science. On, on the bottom left here, we see the ability to tailor the beam, either in this case using a self-seeded beam, you know, or following the leadership of uh, uh, facilities like Fermi at Electra, using externally seeded beams to have. Uh, you know, longitudinal as well as uh, transverse coherence in our beam. And then finally, in this example, uh, looking at the ability to uh, produce not just one, uh, but, but two or four or eight pulses in which you can have, you know, reasonably arbitrary ability to uh, choose the temporal separation, uh, choose uh, colors between the different beams, and even choose whether one of them is, uh, is seeded or not. You know, the, the temporal separation can go from you know, coincident to a few femtoseconds, in up to a good fraction of a microsecond in separation. And then when you combine that with the repetition rate of our new facilities, you know, running at megahertz rates, you really have the full bandwidth of uh, temporal space in which to uh, be able to probe. You know, so just giving now a, a quick example of the type of science that's underway and the type of techniques that enable it, and hopefully this will form a lot of the discussion over the next uh, two or three days. Um, you know, I'm just picking up uh, three examples. The first, led by you know, a team here at Slack, ZX Shen and company, combining um, uh, X-ray scattering uh, capabilities with offline optical capabilities in the lock-in method to here track the, the coupling of uh, electrons and phonons in this uh, superconducting material iron selenide. And you can maybe see in the chart you know, the, the precision and, and the beauty of the data that comes out. You know, these, um, you may not be able to see, but these are tenths of picometer oscillations in the, in the lattice. You know, coupling with the, uh, the electron field, which provides a very direct measurement, you know, without the need for models or theory of what that coupling parameter is. And in this particular case showed it was about an order of magnitude different from expectation. Now, the second example here led out of a group from, uh, from Berkeley Lab you know, is uh, looking at each of the stages of uh, photosystem two, all the way up to, but not quite yet, the oxygen uh, evolution stage, you know, showing here the ability to combine scattering and spectroscopy to, uh, to look at both the structure and the chemical reactivity of a complex system you know, in, in real time. And then finally, you know, maybe a third of our work at LCLS, uh, and I'm sure at many other facilities as well, is in the area of uh, biochemistry and biomedicine. You know, the ability of these X-ray beams in an imaging mode to uh, take not just high resolution structures, but do so in physiologically relevant conditions and, and move into uh, increasingly looking at the dynamics of those systems, you know, for, for some of the most important uh, drug targets in, in the market. You know, here just showing an example led out of ASU, uh, published a few months ago in Structure, where they compared uh, room temperature measurements from uh, LCLS uh, with uh, uh, frozen measurements from an NMR system and showing that it really did make a difference to have these uh, uh, physiologically relevant conditions in the, in the system this particular case for a, a pathogen called uh, Tulermia. So finally, looking to the future and hopefully, you know, what will be, again, a significant part of your discussion this week. You know, we have uh, European XFBL, of course, now operational uh, with its instruments all now turned on. And you know, here at Slack, we're, we're very excited to see our new undulator hall. For those who haven't had a chance to come and visit recently, you know, the, the iconic undulator for LCLS has been uh, removed. And this, uh, this whole area transformed into a new dual undulator space with the soft X-ray train on the left and the hard X-ray train vertically polarized on the right, you know, both variable gaps. 
uh, that we'll be turning on over the next few months. Um, and then in over the next 18 months, two years or so, as Chi Chang mentioned, you know, turn on at the very uh, far end of the, uh, the, the LINAC tunnel, uh, this uh, superconducting system that runs CW. So we'll be able to go all the way up to uh, megahertz and have an entirely arbitrary programmable pulse structure up to that rate. Yeah, so we, we see uh, hopefully the turn on of LCLS over the next uh, few weeks. We're targeting the middle of the summer, maybe uh, middle of August or so uh, to start experiments again. You know, and hopefully straight out of the box, we'll be able to uh, make use of some of the new capabilities of these new undulators, both its tunability, uh, the ability to get you know, these ultra short pulses and multiple pulse isolated at a seconds. You know, when we fully populate the hard X-ray undulator getting up to about 25 kilovolts in, in the fundamental and beyond that in the, in the harmonics at multi millijoule per pulse capabilities. And then perhaps, you know, most uh, dramatically from a uh, capability point of view, turning on four new instruments over the course of the next uh, two or three years. Initially an AMO facility called a TMO, a chemical uh, science facility, Chemrix, a material science facility, QRIX, and what, what I think is the, will be the world's only dual uh, XFEL facility that can take beam from both of these undulators in both an imaging and uh, spectroscopy mode for looking at uh, you know, nonlinear X-ray science and uh, uh, taking single particle imaging, hopefully to its uh, nirvana, uh, we'll see. And then you know, towards the middle of the decade, extend the number of cry modules here in the, in the tunnel to get the, uh, uh, the high repetition rate, uh, high average power lasing all the way up to uh, you know, deep into the hard X-ray domain. For those of you who live at the very far end of our far, uh, experimental hall, you know, the other big project underway is, of course, the upgrade to our MEC instruments. You know, going from tens of joules to kilojoules and going from tens of uh, terawatts to, uh, uh, to a thousand terawatts or a petawatt in combination with our hard X-ray beam. So, uh, you know, huge amount of capability there. And so the challenge now, of course, is to, to point this you know, most effectively at, uh, at the science that you, you care most about. And I think if I could leave you with just one message, it's this, uh, uh, this line on the bottom here that, you know, designing and delivering and analyzing an XFEL experiment is quite different to uh, almost any other discipline in the world. It really is a very close collaboration between yourself, you know, as the, the holder of the, the scientific problem, uh, between the X-ray scientist from a technique and capability point of view, the accelerator and FEL scientist for tuning the beam in ways that I showed earlier on, and increasingly, you know, data and control scientists, as we go to these high repetition rate systems and maybe, you know, hundreds of gigabyte per second uh, data rates, you know, we'll need entirely new ways of uh, capturing, analyzing, and assessing our data. So, uh, you know, I look forward to the discussions uh, with you all this week, and uh, you know, hopefully, we can you know, spend some time together also. And with that, I'll uh, I'll hand back to Thomas. Thank you very much. That was a really great overview. Um, so before we hand over uh, to our first lecture, I wanted to show a few more slides about how uh, about our a little bit of advertising for our institute and some more information about uh, how the rest of the day will go and how everything this this whole um, um, uh, Zoom event works. So th this is uh, just a little bit of an overview over my scientific home here, Pulse Institute, um, which is a Stanford Independent Institute. Um, it's uh, at the same time also a research uh, center within the Energy Science Directorate of SLAC. So it's kind of uh, a joint institute between Stanford and SLAC. It strives to provide world leadership in ultrafast and high field X-ray science. And it's really making use of this um, strong, not only spatial, but also intellectual um, um, closeness to uh, um, our LCLS facility and is trying to, to uh, leverage these transformational research opportunities. And you can see that we have a large number of groups doing pretty diverse stuff um, from X-ray cluster dynamics imaging over ultrafast chemistry, to strong field AMO science, after second science, and, and theory. That just as a, um, a quick information about my institute, and hopefully I can now switch slides. Yes. 
Um, this is just a little reminder of how um, this is uh, technically going to work. So um, you are uh, really encouraged to ask questions during the lectures and also during the tour and so on. This is supposed to be an interactive event. And if you ask questions, you get more out of this event. For the questions, please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And in case the lecturer asks the audience a question and wants a response, uh, please, in this case, use the raise hand feature. Um, then uh, going a little bit uh, beyond uh, the first lecture, after the first lecture, you will have a break. And the break is in a separate Zoom meeting. And this is uh, a Zoom meeting um, basically only for you. You will get distributed into uh, smaller groups in the Zoom meeting. And um, uh, this is um, uh, intended for you to get to know each other, talk about the research you're excited about or talk about anything else. And uh, the Zoom link for that is on the Canvas calendar. And then please tune back in to the introduction of mock-up proposals and the LCLS tool, which will be in the same Zoom webinar. Uh, let me have a look at the time. I think we have time for a few um, um, organizational questions, if anybody has any. Um, um, maybe Sheetal, you can have a look if anything is coming up. Um, nothing, nothing yet. If there's a question, please go ahead and type it into the question answer form. We have one. We have one question. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now they have three. <laughs> uh, so uh, the first question is, are these workshops being recorded? And the answer is yes, they are being recorded. Uh, how many are viewing this? Um, it's at the moment 159 participants and we are also live streaming to YouTube. And right. I see at the moment that there are another 50 participants on YouTube. And then uh, the next one, will the recordings of these meetings be posted onto Canvas? Yes. So I will set uh, the recordings of these meetings probably on YouTube. Uh, for some of the meetings, we, uh, for some of the uh, lectures, we have permission to, to just put them publicly on YouTube. For the other ones, I will um, create uh, private links and then you can also access them. Um, I will post the links on Canvas. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, there are more questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, how the, the break time conversation will be coordinated? Will there be any coordinator? Um, there will be a, a, a meeting host, Matt Ver, um, who you can also uh, communicate and ask questions, but this is really supposed to be your time. So um, that's only coordinated by you. Uh, will we receive beam time at LCLS if our group submits a great proposal? <laughs> If it's no. great, <laughs> it gives you a great start at least. So, uh. if it's great enough, it will also make it through the PRP. So, exactly uh, probably right. yes. <laughs> Always happy to see great proposals. But you have to resubmit it to the to the LCLS PRP. You great. do, unfortunately, so. And there are actually cases I know from a right. uh, from a proposal from the 2018 summer school. They they resubmitted it as a real proposal and, and did an experiment here. So that happens. It really is worth the effort for sure. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, is it a group proposal or an individual one? It is supposed to be group work. Um, so you're um, distributed into proposal groups on on Canvas. And uh, you get, uh, have a mentor assigned to this group. 
if you decide to split up into smaller groups and um, uh, submit several proposals in one of these canvas groups, that's okay. Uh, you can do that, um, but um, it's it's supposed to be group work. Uh, one more question here. Uh, are the slides presented going to be accessible for the attendees? Um, yes, I will also upload uh, links or upload the slides uh, themselves uh, to Zoom as uh, to Canvas as soon as I have them. Okay. All right. Um, All right. Any other, anything else? <laughs> um, I think. Uh, I think we're good. Okay, then we are slightly ahead of time, which is great. Um, then I would say it's it's a time for me to introduce with a great pleasure, Georgia Margheritondo, who is gonna give the first lecture on, on X-ray sources. Georgia is a veteran of the summer school. He has given uh, quite a, a number of lectures here already. And I'm really, really pleased that he agreed um, to uh, speak again here. Um, Giorgio, the virtual stage is yours. Okay, uh, the, let me check, can you hear and uh, see me? I can hear and see you. Switch to me. Okay, all right, okay. So, uh, first of all, um, thank you very much indeed for uh, this event. It is a most exciting event for me and uh, I hope uh, it is going to be exciting for you too. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you heard that we are beating uh, the uh, uh, records for the number of participants, which is also a, a big job for the speakers. A um, couple of uh, uh, comments about organization. Uh, as it is the uh, tradition in this school, I'm going to uh, ask uh, once in a while very simple questions about the thing that I am going to present. And after uh, one or two minutes, I'm going to show you the answer just to break the uh, presentation. Um, I have one hour and a half. Um, I will not speak without interruptions for one hour and a half. You're going to have a short break, maybe five or 10 minutes, uh, about uh, uh, two thirds of the way before the end of the presentation. So I'm almost ready to start. Let me share the screen. There it is. Okay, so. We are starting uh, with uh, a little bit of music. And, uh, you may recognize this is Swiss music, and there is a good reason for that. First of all, I'm broadcasting from Switzerland, but even more important, I'm going to present a lot of things that are related to uh, relativity, because our business here is uh, relativity. And uh, where I'm sitting in Renan is not too far, it's about 50 miles from where Albert Einstein actually invented relativity in 1905. So let me stop the music and then just a couple of words about the origin of this presentation. Actually it was uh, some time ago when I was still a young assistant professor and I wanted to uh, explain uh, to my junior collaborators about uh, synchrotron radiation. And I've been looking uh, for uh, simple presentations, uh, especially for people that are not from physics uh, and so may not have the necessary background. I was um, a bit disappointed at the time. And so I started an effort and this effort has been going on for uh, decades. As a matter of fact, it is never ending you can see here that the latest publications are from one year ago, and you are very welcome. They are all available in my website. Uh, they are open. And so if you want to expand, you are very welcome to look at them. Now, uh, before uh, we um, get started, I need to uh, get some motivation. Okay, there is right now a lot of people around that are following this talk. Why should be 
so interesting to talk about uh, synchrotron radiation and in general about X-rays, okay? Um, as you may know, uh, this is becoming a gigantic worldwide uh, enterprise. We have more than 60 facilities, uh, investment that uh, exceed uh, $100 billion. We have at least 50,000, probably much more uh, of uh, users uh, throughout the world. So why are we so much interested in X-rays? And I'd like to give you some uh, general comments about that by changing the question a little bit. That is, uh, the question could be, what in nature uh, we can study, we can analyze by using uh, the wavelengths and the photon energies of uh, X-rays? So let's have a look at the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. This is the entire spectrum. X-rays are located about here. We can expand a little bit. And you can see here what are the wavelengths we are talking about and what are the photon energies. So the question here is what in nature do we find that have a size or an energy size commensurate to uh, these quantities and therefore can be studied with the X-rays? And it is very simple. If you're looking at the size, you find the length of chemical bonds and therefore all the things that are related to the length of chemical bonds, like the distance between atoms in molecules and in solids, including unfortunately some notorious viruses that are making our life so miserable right now. From the point of view of the photon energy, what we find here are the energies of electrons that are related to chemical bonds, either the valence electrons that participate in the formation of chemical bonds or the core electrons that do not participate directly but are affected by the charge redistribution of chemical bonds. Now you can summarize all these in very simple terms. X-rays, are the ideal probes of chemical bonds. Is this important? You bet it is, because if you look carefully at the things we are studying in science and technology, you find that 99.99% of them are really directly or indirectly related to chemical bonds. So here we are not talking about a niche problem or a niche issue. We're not talking about specialized instruments, you're talking about the general instruments to study uh, one of the most important ingredients of modern science and technology. Now, I hope that in this way I whetted your appetite because I'm ready to start our discovery. I mean, the, the uh, conclusion of this is that we need to get good sources of X-rays. Unfortunately, when we start analyzing the situation, we uh, find, first of all, a huge problem and then a paradox. So let's see what is the huge problem and then what is the paradox. Let me start by proposing not to try to emit X-rays, but uh, 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 electromagnetic waves of a completely different kinds, like radio waves, the uh, the wavelength could be on the order of one meter, and you can quickly realize that the devices that we are using for emitting this kind of uh, electromagnetic waves have a physical size, which is not uh, very different with respect to the size of the wavelength. So we could uh, imagine a scary law. Now we must go from uh, one meter to the wavelength of X-rays, and we are talking about angstroms perhaps, so we should shrink the source to dimensions that are of the order of uh, one or two atoms. Now, this is not uh, a totally crazy idea because if you uh, look at the uh, conventional sources of X-rays, those you find in a medical cabinet, then uh, you can realize that what is really emitting radiation X-rays there are the atoms in the source. However, there is a problem that is um, these sources, the conventional sources, they are very good for medical cabinets, but they're very bad for research. 
And you can understand that because in a medical cabinet, everyone is shielding uh, themselves uh, to protect uh, their bodies from uh, dangerous radiation, which means that most of the emission is not going where uh, it, it is useful, but rather uh, it is spread everywhere. And furthermore, the flux is uh, pretty weak to start with. So we would like to get much better sources. We would like to construct artificial devices that are much better than the conventional sources. But problem is that if the scaling law works, then we should build devices by using one or two atoms. And this, uh, unfortunately, is mission impossible. So this is the huge problem. And now we are ready for the paradox. The paradox is that in spite of all this analysis, <clears throat> we have been using good sources, excellent sources of X-rays for many decades. And let me show you a picture, okay? Uh, this is one of my preferred sources, Electra in Trieste. Now, doesn't look like a device made by one or two atoms. It looks to me more like a device, which is of the size of uh, uh, one or two kilometers. And so here is the uh, paradox. That is, we started saying that we need to work on the scale of atoms. And instead, we are working with devices that are in the scale of kilometers. How do we solve this paradox? Well, this is uh, probably the main message that is going to continue throughout my presentation. And the solution is given by our good friend, Albert Einstein, okay? It's Albert Einstein that teaches us how using relativity, you can shrink down things in a virtual way. And therefore our discovery today will be primarily how to do it in practice. Now, before getting to that, let me mention that if you read the uh, uh, original article of 1905, one of the three, uh, uh, articles of Albert Einstein of that wonderful year, you can see that uh, he even predicted the existence of synchrotron radiation because he analyzed the problem of a source of light with an observer that was moving towards the uh, source of light, which is equivalent in relativity to the problem of the source of light that moves towards the observer. And uh, he came to the conclusion that uh, you change the intensity using this equation. You can see here in the denominator one minus V over C, which means that if the velocity back becomes relativistic, then the intensity becomes infinity. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is synchrotron radiation. So this is what he told us. It is absolutely amazing to me. So now that we made this uh, historical discovery, we are ready to start discovering how we can use relativity in order to build good sources of uh, X-rays. And uh, <clears throat> in the discovery, we shall see that uh, in each case, uh, we are going to have always the combination of not, not a one relativistic effect, but of two relativistic effects. So we'll see what they are. So uh, let me start from uh, something very simple classical, that is no relativity for the moment. And classical physics is telling us that uh, if you want to emit electromagnetic waves, like X-rays, then you need a charge and you must accelerate this charge. We have the freedom to select the charge and I like to propose to you to use electrons. The reason is because not only they are charged, but they have a small mass and so it is easier to accelerate them. So we start manipulating electrons and we need to build some kind of device. Let me propose to you this device, which is a series of magnets, what we call in this business an undulator. It is a periodic series of magnets. You send an electron. For the moment, we have a speed which is smaller than the speed of light, so it is non-relativistic. And uh, you can uh, understand in some way uh, the electron is going to emit uh, electromagnetic radiation. Let's have a look at the uh, uh, ondulator from the top. We will send the electron. 
the electron will oscillate in the transverse direction, will be accelerated, and therefore it will start emitting radiation. And we'll see it here. Of course, the question is, what's going to be the wavelength of this radiation? Are we going to emit X-rays? And the answer is no, because you can imagine that the wavelength will be uh, somehow related to the period of the undulator, which is typically something of the order of centimeters. So this is not X-rays. So this is more like the microwaves or the microwave oven you find in your kitchen. So we need to move to X-rays. And for that, you must inject relativity, which means that we are going to go from a small speed to a large speed close to the speed of light. And now, as it is done um, in relativity, typically, we are going to change our point of view and look at things from the point of view of this electron, OK? So from the point of view of the electron, the ondulator is coming, traveling at a speed that is close to the speed of light, OK? Now, this is not the most important thing. The important thing is that there is a relativistic effect that shrinks the length of things when they are moving towards the observer. And so we see uh, this so-called Lorentz contraction, for example, for the period of the ondulator. And the period will decrease to uh, L over gamma, okay, where gamma is the uh, relativistic uh, gamma factor. We see here the contraction, which is uh, one divided by the square root of one minus v square over squeeze c square, which is also in relativity the energy of the electron divided by the rest energy. So if you're looking at quantities, we find that if v is large, close to the speed of light, then gamma becomes pretty big. In practical cases, for our synchrotron sources, we are talking about a few thousand for the factor of gamma up to something uh, more than 10,000, like 12,000, or even more, OK? So we are uh, in, the, in the right path in order to uh, emit X-rays, because now we are shrinking L to L divided by gamma. And we are even more in the right path, since this is not all. This is just one half of the uh, picture. And we have to go beyond that, because L over gamma here, uh, is the wavelength that is emitted from the point of view of the electron. But we are not using this wavelength in the reference frame of the electron. Rather, we are using it in the reference frame of the laboratory. And so there is a second effect here, which is the Doppler effect. Because the source in the laboratory, the electron, is a moving source. Now, you can see the Doppler effect uh, every day in life, like if you're going to a train station and there is a train coming towards you, then uh, the sound of the train goes like, uh, meaning, uh, I hope you got that, the sound, meaning uh, that uh, uh, because of the Doppler effect, it goes to higher frequencies uh, and therefore to shorter wavelengths. For, um, Electromagnetic waves like uh, X-rays, you have the same effect, but uh, this is uh, now a relativistic effect. And so you have to treat it using relativity. It becomes very big. And therefore, the emitted wavelength seen in the laboratory is going to be shrunk again by a factor of one divided by two gamma. Now we put everything together and what we are going to get is gamma from the Lorentz contraction, two gamma from the Doppler effect, all together is two gamma squared. So what we observe in the laboratory is a wavelength, which is the period of the ondulator divided by two gamma squared. Gamma is big, gamma squared is even bigger. It is in the denominator, so we are getting a lot of shrinking. And if you try to plug some numbers, you find that in this way, with a gamma of 5,000, we go from a typical ondulator field of one centimeter to two angstroms. So we are in business. We are emitting X-rays. Now, before um, 
leaving this part, let me summarize by saying that then if you want to use uh, relativity in order to produce X-rays, you need uh, some kind of accelerator, an electron accelerator that's going to give you electrons that are relativistic with high energy and high speed. Then you need an ondulator. And as the ondulator, the electrons are passing through the ondulator, you are getting X-rays. Now, uh, this is not uh, a complete picture because um, we must also ask ourselves if this is a good way to build a good source of X-rays. But before doing that, let me stop from, uh, for, for the first questions, okay? And um, my first question is the following. An ondulator has a period of eight centimeters and um, it is uh, inserted in a storage ring in an accelerator and the uh, central wavelength that is emitted is 100 angstroms. Can you evaluate what is the energy in uh, a GeV of the uh, electrons in the storage ring? Now, I will propose to you four different answers. These are the symbols that are normally used when uh, the uh, uh, people participating are present in the room. And they would, at this point, try to find the answer and raise uh, a sign uh, with their preferred answer. You have to do that on your own, folks. I'm sorry, OK? But I'll give you a, a, a short time in order to think about this and uh, consult with the people that are around you or write the answer before uh, I will show you what is uh, the correct answer. And there it is, OK? Here, you're talking about an accelerator with uh, two uh, GeV, OK? Uh, so I see uh, something with the poles here. I will close it because I'm going to the next question, OK? Now, the next question is uh, about an electron of two GeV, so perhaps the same electron of the first question. And uh, we have an ondulator with a period of one centimeter. And I want to know from you what is the emitted wavelength in the reference frame of the electron. I will propose to you one angstrom, one centimeter, 10 micron, or 2.5 micron. And once again, I'm leaving you uh, uh, a few seconds in order to uh, find out what is the correct answer. And Georgia, I was a little bit too uh, slow for the first polling, but the second polling should work now. So you should see a result now. OK. Uh, what should I do in order to see the results? Um, I can end the polling, and then you should see the result. OK. Um, Thank you. Let's do that maybe now. OK. Uh, there is no open question. I don't know. There it is. All right. So 60% is uh, one angstrom, uh, and the others are distributed. So it looks like uh, I tricked you. <laughs> I succeeded. This is a tricky question. The tricky question is that, of course, one angstrom is the uh, wavelength of uh, X-rays. But here, uh, I did not ask the wavelength in the laboratory frame. I asked the wavelength in the reference frame of the electron. And so uh, in the reference frame of the electron, you get the Lorentz contraction, but you do not get the Doppler effect. And the correct answer, indeed, is 2.5 micron. So we are halfway in this process of shrinking down. All right, so much for the uh, question, the first question. So now we are going to the uh, next step, OK? Because up until now, we just demonstrated that uh, you can use relativity to produce X-rays. But this is not our objective. The objective is to get a good source of X-rays. And so are we in business? Well, before uh, answering, uh, actually, we had to uh, uh, understand or to make an agreement of what is a good source of X-rays. Perhaps is a source that is emitting uh, a lot of X-rays. Well, yes or not. I mean, uh, emitting a lot of X-rays is good, but it's not all. And to understand what they are talking about, <clears throat> I'd like to invite you to consider 
a comparison between a fireplace and a flashlight. Now, a fireplace is a very cozy thing. It's very nice for the winter, but energetically speaking, it is not very effective. And you realize that because if you are trying to illuminate something like you're trying to catch a rat, then you realize that you're not going to concentrate very much radiation here because the area that is emitting is pretty big and the angle of emission is pretty big also. So instead of that, you like to use a flashlight because the flashlight is concentrating the radiation in a small angular range and it has a small emitting area. So it is a better source from different points of view, which means that we are to define what is a good X-ray source by using the same criteria. And this is done with a parameter that is called brightness or brilliance. So let's see what is this parameter. Um, you have to combine, first of all, the flux, but also the geometric characteristics, that is the area of the source, this one, and the solid angle of emission. We put everything together by taking something proportional to the flux divided by the two geometric parameters, which means you get high brightness for a good source, if you increase the flux, of course, but it is not all. You also need to have small geometric parameters, a small size of the uh, source, a small angular range in order to increase the brightness. And so are we doing that? Are we getting a high brightness by using relativity? Well, let's have a look, okay? This is the historical picture. And we start from uh, Röntgen. Amazingly, the thing did not change very much for brightness for a long period of time. But then, bang, synchronous radiation arrived, and we started increasing and increasing and increasing. And this is not the end of the story. Actually, we are still increasing here. Now, that's absolutely fantastic, because if you are looking at the magnitude here, this is a lot scale, which is compressed. So you're talking about something like 26 orders of magnitude or more. Every time I'm looking at that, there is an increase. And if you are comparing that to what happens in computers, you find that our colleagues in computer technology are bragging about their improvements in performance, but they only improved by seven orders of magnitude during this time. We did that by 26 orders of magnitude. So not only relativity is, good, is giving us X-rays, but it's giving us fantastic sources of X-rays. So we really are in business. And let's continue then our discovery. Because the question now, of course, is uh, what is that makes the brightness so high, okay? Uh, and we find that there are actually four different factors that are increasing the brightness to these fantastic values. Two of them are related to relativity and two are not. So let me start from a non-relativistic one. First of all, uh, compared to a conventional source in which the electrons are attached, for example, to a solid, uh, we have electrons that are in a vacuum chamber and therefore, they cannot melt the solid by emitting too much power. So our electrons in an accelerator can handle a much higher power emission. Second, the source size is small. Now, do not make a mistake here because you could imagine that the source size is the cross section of one electron, but this is not true because in an accelerator, you can see here that we do not have only one electron. We actually have a collection of electrons, uh, many more than this. And therefore, what is emitting a light is a source, which is the transverse cross section of the bunch of electrons. Nevertheless, it is very small because accelerator technology has become very sophisticated. So you're talking about a very, very small size here. And now let's look at the uh, relativistic factors. In the uh, brightness, uh, relativity is increasing a lot the bit of power. And also relativity is decreasing the angle of divergence uh, and therefore uh, increasing uh, the brightness because this is in the denominator. 
So let's look at these two uh, factors. First of all, how do we get a lot of power uh, by using relativity and the synchrotron source? Once again, let's step back to classical physics. Without relativity, we know that the uh, emission is going to be proportional to the square of the acceleration. So if you have an acceleration of a given value, the power is going to be proportional to the square of it, okay? Now, we have to make things relativistic. So once again, we have the longitudinal velocity close to the speed of light. And now we have to make a relativistic transformation of the acceleration, which is pretty simple because uh, the acceleration is going to be a coordinate divided by uh, a time squared, okay? So uh, the coordinate is a transverse coordinate and it is not going to be affected in relativity by longitudinal motion. The time changes like one over gamma. So it is divided by gamma, which means that the acceleration, which is one divided by the time square will be multiplied by gamma square. The emitted power, is the square of the acceleration proportional to, and therefore it is going to be gamma to the fourth power. To the fourth power, okay, which is a high power. And therefore we are taking advantage of the high values of gamma or the energy of the electrons, because this is going to the fourth power. First of all, we are getting a lot of uh, uh, power emitted because the energy is getting with this power. But there is a second point here, which must also be taken into account. That is uh, in the expression of gamma, you find the mass, the rest mass in the denominator. That is why we are using uh, electron accelerators and not proton accelerators. Because if you are taking a, a particle with a big mass, then the emission goes down. It is in the denominator like the fourth power of the mass. So we are not going to use the Large Hadron Collider now or in the future to emit synchronous radiation because it's not a good way to do that, okay? We need the light particles. Now, last, let's see how relativity is decreasing the angular collimation. And here, first of all, we start from the point of view of the electron. So this is the reference frame of the electron. The electron is uh, oscillating in this reference frame. And uh, this is the classic uh, uh, problem of a radio antenna. So you know that uh, the emission is not going to be uh, 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 limited to uh, a narrow angular range, but it is uh, spread over a wide range. Now we are changing and we are looking at things from the point of view of the laboratory in which we see that uh, the electron is moving at high speed and the emission is no longer spread, but it is uh, limited to a very, very narrow cone. How can we understand that? Here, uh, I'm going to something very embarrassing because you know I like soccer. I hope you like soccer too, uh, but in these days uh, there is no soccer, which is good because, uh, because of my Italian origins, I like to uh, watch the soccer game, so the Italian soccer team, which is not playing right now, but even if it was playing, it would be no good because for several years it was bad. So uh, if it was good, after a soccer team, you would have a lot of people going around in town, uh, making a lot of noise from their cars, okay? And if you uh, look carefully at this phenomenon, you can realize that actually because of the motion of the car, the sound is projected ahead. So this is a, a phenomenon like this, uh, but once again, relativity kicks in. And so for uh, uh, electromagnetic waves, it is much more pronounced than for sound waves. So the electrons, uh, become like flashlights, but also super narrow flashlights. Let's see why, it's very simple. We will start from uh, a, the emission of a photon in a transverse direction, okay? So this is a broad angular range. And now we see how things are changing when we go from the point of view of the electron 
to the one of the laboratory. And we can realize, number one, that the magnitude is not changing because that is the speed of light. And therefore, this velocity is simply rotating by keeping the magnitude constant. And if you are looking at how the two components are changing in relativity, you find that the angle with respect to the longitudinal direction seen in the laboratory, which is this one, is simply going to be given by one over gamma. This is about one half of the angular spread. So the total angular spread is going to be twice theta, which is twice over gamma. Don't forget, as we are talking about gamma, we are talking about something of the order of 1,000 to 10,000. So we start from micro radians and we are going down which means we are, we are talking about the flashlight effect. This is a super narrow flashlight effect. And therefore, once again, relativity helps us by increasing the brightness. Now, not only that, but if you are following this path, okay, we are going to discover a lot of things. However, I think it's time now for a second set of questions. Thomas, I hope you're right with your uh, device to see what is the answer. And so the question is, uh, a positron and an electron with the same energy are passing through an ondulator in a storage ring. And which one of the two will emit more power or synchronous radiation? And I'm going to give you these options, either the positron or uh, the electron or uh, no emission at all or the same power. And no, let me know one. when you want to stop the polling. Uh, I think this is a simple one, so I'll stop now. OK. And here we have the results. OK, now you are getting smart, folks. <laughs> OK, or the question is too simple. Uh, most of the people gave the right answer, uh, which is, of course, that uh, the emission is the same because uh, electron and positron are in the same mass. The mass is in the denominator, the fourth power. So there is no difference between the two. Next question. So what is uh, the angle, the, the order of magnitude of the angular spread of the synchronous emission from an ondulator? Now, this is a straightforward question. And so I'm proposing to you one radian, uh, 100 of a radian, 1,000 of a radian, or a radian divided by 1,000. That's and the polling is on. <laughs> Stop here, OK. OK. All right. Uh, that makes me happy because uh, the vast majority of the people are not falling asleep in spite of uh, all the time difference. Uh, they gave the right answer. That's great. So now this is the right answer. Now that we learned about the right answer, I would like to show you that we can still manipulate relativistic concepts in very simple ways and explain a lot of other properties about the synchrotron sources. Up until now, we've been talking about ondulators, but actually there are, in a typical synchrotron facility, several different kinds of sources. This is a generic scheme of a storage ring with a radio frequency cavity and an injection system. But what is important is notice that we have here not only ondulators, we also have bending magnets, these are the magnets that are keeping the electrons in this closed orbit. And then we have wigglers. So what is the difference between ondulators, bending magnets, and wigglers? The theories are pretty complicated once again, but you can understand some basic things by using a very simple criteria. So I'd like to propose, first of all, a ondulator and see what is the flashlight effect. We are looking at things Georgia? from the top point of view. Georgia? We are taking a, a small detector here. We are sending uh, an electron. Now, Georgia, can current... you hear me? Yes. There's a question from the audience. OK, go ahead. What about destructive interference for positron and electron? Isn't the radiation phase shifted by pi? Uh, you mean if you have both an electron and a positron? Because this was not a question. The question was either an electron or a positron. 
Okay, so we are not uh, getting uh, interference because the two particles are not in the same time uh, in, in the storage ring. Okay, so let me recover now the top view and we are sending uh, an electron inside the ondulator. Uh, an ondulator has a small magnetic field and therefore the undulations in the transverse direction are not very big. So we can now follow what's going on to the flashlight. There it is. You can see something very interesting. And I will repeat that once again. You can see here, because of the small undulations, the flashlight does not leave the small area detector. It keeps being in the small area detector, which means that we get a long signal pulse. This is not a short one in time, it's pretty long. We can use the Fourier theorem, and we know that a long pulse corresponds to a narrow bandwidth, either in frequency or in wavelength. And so our first conclusion is that an ondulator is going to emit the central wavelength that we mentioned before, we calculated before, but also a narrow band of wavelengths around it. And this is the characteristic of an ondulator. Now, let me go on. Now we are looking at uh, a bending magnet. A bending magnet uh, is a single uh, a dipole. So we are looking at things from the top point of view. It is the electron that starts emitting the flashlight as it enters the bending magnet. And uh, let's see what happens. Bang. Repeat that. Bang. Once again, last one. Bang. So you see what uh, is the difference. That is, we are not getting uh, a long pulse. We are getting uh, a short pulse. Fourier theorem, a short pulse means a very broad band of frequency or wavelength. Now that is important because this means that uh, a bending magnet is offering you a very wide range of wavelengths and therefore you can then use a monochromator to select the wavelengths that you want, uh, which makes it possible to uh, tune the wavelength for specific experiments. So this is for many magnets and now let's move to the uh, third kind of sources that is the wigglers. A wiggler looks very much like an ondulator, uh, but there is a big difference that is uh, for a wiggler, there is a, a pretty big field, a strong magnetic field, and therefore the ondulations are no longer weak. They are pretty big. So we can follow what's going on here. And you can see that there is, there is a difference with respect to an ondulator. Let me repeat that again. There it is. In, out, in, out, in, out. So this is not a long pulse is not only one short pulse, but it is a series of short pulses. Fourier transform, you are getting a broad band, and um, this is somewhat equivalent to a series of bending magnets, but not being an individual bending magnet, you are getting more intensity than from a bending magnet. So in this way, uh, with the three different kinds of sources, they are getting a lot of flexibility. You can get a broad band, you can get a narrow band, uh, you can increase the uh, intensity if you want, uh, and uh, you can also uh, use uh, any kind of magnetic field here without worrying about the rest of the accelerator. All right, let's continue our discovery, but uh, let me tell you that uh, uh, I could go on uh, not for an hour and a half, uh, but for uh, about uh, uh, two days uh, if I continue with this discovery. So let me reassure you, I'm not going to do that. You can look at the papers if you want to do that. Uh, but let me say that, for example, for bending magnets uh, going very quickly and not looking uh, very closely at the equations, uh, you can uh, start from classical physics, uh, calculate the cyclotron frequency, and from that get the emitter wavelengths. And then uh, you use... Uh, uh, Giorgio, and, uh, there's another question. Yes. 
Um, the question is from Frank and he asks, will you have a series of increasingly shorter pulses from the Wiggler or, or sorry, sorry. Um, the we have two questions actually. How does uh, the temporal profile of the pulse change when you select a specific wavelength with a monochromator? Um, I'm not sure I get the question. I mean, uh, uh, because with the monochromator, uh, uh, you are uh, automatically shrinking the wave, the, 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 the bandwidth. And so uh, you are getting from the bandwidth that would come from the series of pulses with much shorter one to a much narrower one. And that is the effect of the uh, monochromator. But the monochromator does not have any effect on the initial emission. It just filters it. OK? I, there's a second question. Uh, will you have a series of increasingly shorter pulses from the Wiggler, or will they all be the same duration? The beam seems to be getting smaller. Uh, that depends uh, on the uh, time that is spent uh, by each uh, pole, by, by each uh, flashlight uh, in the detector, and so uh, I, I, I have been presenting a very simple scheme, but uh, the actual answer uh, will depend on the characteristics of the detector, so it will change with the area of the detector and so on. So you have a lot of flexibility to change the uh, uh, poles, the, the, the duration of individual pulses. Okay. okay, and we have a third question. You have a very attentive audience, <laughs> um, but I think that's the last one for now. Oh no, there's another one. Um, as the electrons travel through the magnet, since they are emitting, they will lose energy. Isn't that going to change the speed of the electron and then thus change the emitted spectrum? Thank you very much. That's a very good question because we will learn later on that uh, if we did not do something about that, we just lose the electrons. And so the electrons would leave the storage ring. It would not continue circulating. So keep that in mind, because we we'll learn in a few minutes how you can solve that problem. OK. And the one. last question, and I think I will close the question then for now. Would you expect the power of the emitted radiation to be larger for a wiggler compared to an undulator? Uh, that again, it, it depends on the characteristic of the specific device, uh, but uh, typically you get more from uh, a wiggler than from an ondulator. And let me also say that there is a continuum that is, uh, you have a transition between the wiggler regime and the ondulator regime, so there is also an intermediate regime between the two. All right, so. Uh, we were uh, in the uh, simple theory of bending magnets, and what I'm telling you is that uh, by using simple relativity, you can go from a classical case uh, to the relativistic case, and then uh, you can kick in the uh, Doppler effect, and uh, you get uh, the uh, uh, central limit equivalent of this uh, wide band, okay? But actually, we learned that the actual spectrum is a broad one, so if you want to really get a good uh, theory, you have to go beyond that. Okay, so uh, going on with the discovery of characteristics, polarization is another important characteristic of a source, especially for things like uh, uh, spectroscopy. And it is perhaps the simplest one to understand. I'd like to invite you to have a look at uh, an electron that is circulating in a storage ring from three different points of view, the top view, the side view, and the tilted view. So you see what the electron is doing. Now, suppose that you are looking at the emitted radiation from any one of the sources that we mentioned before, either from the top view or the side view or the tilted view. I mean, the top view, don't, don't bother with because we have learned that there is the flashlight effect. And so if you're getting out of the plane of the ring, the intensity goes down and you're getting essentially no emission. The side view, this is the perturbation that is caused by the electron, and therefore you are getting linear polarization in the plane of the ring. When you're getting out of the plane of the ring, then the trajectory looks like an elliptical trajectory. So no mystery, you're getting elliptical polarization. It's not a good way to get elliptical polarization because once again, there is a flashlight effect. And so if you're getting out of the plane of the ring, the intensity goes down. So you need the more specialized devices like 
uh, Wiggler's or undulator that are forcing the electrons to go into uh, spirals in order to get good elliptical polarization. So let me go on with our discovery. And I'd like to make a small summary at this point. What are the properties that we discovered and those that we still had to discover? Check the time. Um, so first of all, we discovered that we have short wavelengths and they can be uh, tunable. Uh, we get polarization. We also get a time structure here. Why so? Because in a storage ring, we are going to get electrons that are circulating around in electron bunches, okay? And now, if this is a detector, then every time the bunch goes through the source, could be an ondulator or a wiggler or a bending magnet, you get a pulse of light. And so, altogether, this is the basic time structure we are getting from a synchrotron source. Now, this also gives me the opportunity to uh, answer the question I was asked, that is, what about the energy that is uh, lost by the electrons because they are emitting light and therefore they are losing energy? Well, uh, you need something more here, uh, that is, uh, you need something to give back the energy to the electrons. That is, you need some kind of device, as perhaps here, uh, that is applying an electric field when the electron bunch grows to the device. This is called the radio frequency cavity. And so in order to keep the electron circulating and emitting, you need to have this energy restoring device. And that's the answer to the question. Let's go on. We discovered that we have very high flux. We have a small source area. We have an angle angle spread. And the combination of this is giving high brightness. But before leaving this list, there's something else that we must discover. It is the combination of the small source area and the narrow angular spread is giving us not only brightness, but also this characteristic that is called coherence. Coherence is something that our colleagues in visible optics uh, have been using for centuries. But for many decades after the discovery of X-rays, it was just ignored. So we had to rediscover coherence. And let's do that once again in a simple way. So what is coherence? Well, uh, you know that we are surrounded by electromagnetic waves. Like, for example, right now, I have the sunlight. Um, it, it's only uh, 6, uh, 6, 6.20 PM here. Uh, I also have a, a visible light source, but uh, although these are waves, uh, I'm not getting uh, diffraction or interference effects. I'm not seeing them. Why so? Because in order to produce these effects, our wave must also have this characteristic that is called coherence, the property that gives you visible wave-like effects like interference or diffraction. So in order to understand what, are this, uh, what, what is this property, we can use any kind of uh, phenomenon like diffraction interference. And I like to propose to you a pinhole diffraction phenomenon in which you have a screen with a pinhole and you are getting a diffraction pattern. Maybe you're getting a diffraction pattern. Now in the case I'm showing you here, which is an extreme one, there is a point source with zero dimension and the source emits only one wavelength. Now, in this case, we are getting a diffraction pattern always, and therefore we have coherence. But now let's look at something more realistic. And uh, by looking at more realistic sources, we will discover two kinds of coherence, what we call time coherence and spatial coherence. So first of all, instead of having only one wavelength, Suppose that the source is emitting a, a band of wavelengths with a certain width. Now, in this case, we find that uh, maybe the pattern is no longer visible. It has become a blob. The second case is in, when instead of having a point source, we have a source of finite size. And there, once again, the pattern may disappear and we do not get uh, a visible uh, diffraction phenomenon. So in the first case, we are talking about time coherence, which is going to be related to the bandwidth. In the second case, 
we have geometric characteristics and we are talking about spatial coherence. Let's discover a little more about this. I mean, first of all, the uh, uh, finite uh, uh, bandwidth of wavelengths. Now you can imagine that in the uh, bandwidth, each one of the uh, wavelengths is going to give you a different diffraction pattern. I'm only showing uh, you two in this case, but when you're putting together all these uh, patterns for uh, individual wavelengths, then the end result may be a blob because the superposition uh, blurs the uh, uh, fringes. So we have to ask ourselves, what are the conditions to still see a pattern? It's very simple because uh, the uh, theory of uh, the diffraction pattern shows that the distance between two fringes is given by this distance divided by the uh, size of the pinhole all multiplied by lambda. So instead of having lambda, you have uh, a delta lambda. That means that you no longer have one single distance. You are blurring this distance to the same factor multiplied by delta lambda. So the condition to see the pattern is simply that uh, this blurring must be smaller than the distance. We do that and we find that the condition is delta lambda over lambda smaller than one. Uh, this is not uh, a very stringent condition. It is a pretty weak one. And by the way, it's the reason for uh, in everyday life, uh, you do see phenomena uh, like uh, interference or diffraction uh, with visible light, like for example, the soap bubbles, because our eyes are doing exactly this uh, for visible light. We can uh, restate the same condition by using this notion of the coherence length, which is uh, uh, lambda squared divided by delta lambda, and we discovered that uh, there is time coherence uh, if the coherence length is bigger than the wavelength. So much for uh, <clears throat> time coherence. And now let's go to uh, uh, spatial or uh, uh, lateral coherence. Uh, now, um, excuse me, let me go a step back. What we can say is that each point of the source is becoming uh, the uh, cause of a different diffraction pattern, but the superposition may blur the features uh, and therefore you don't see a pattern anymore. And uh, you can work out the conditions once again, it's simple geometry. And you find that this is the condition to see pattern feature that is the condition for lateral coherence. Now you can rediscover the same uh, property by taking into account that the source is going to emit in a, a solid angle. Uh, omega, and therefore, of all this radiation, uh, only a portion is going to the pinhole, and therefore is participating uh, to diffraction. This portion is given by the ratio of the two solid angles, which is this one, and uh, by applying this condition, you find uh, this factor. That's another way to express the lateral coherence, uh, that is, uh, this is uh, what is called the coherent power factor, uh, must be large if you want to have lateral coherence. So all this is pretty simple. Uh, there isn't very much mathematics, but you are getting to the important points. And let me make a summary, okay? Uh, this is the conditions for longitudinal coherence. This is the condition for lateral coherence. The first discovery that you make is that you get a lambda square here, sorry. You get a lambda square here and you get a lambda square here. So in both kinds of coherence, we have a wavelength square. That is why people in visible optics have been dealing with coherence for a couple of centuries. In X-rays, we just forgot about it because these wavelengths are very small. The square makes things even smaller. And so getting coherence is much more difficult for X-rays than for visible light. Second, let's look at the brightness. We found the brightness is given by F divided by the geometric parameters. And amazingly, these are the same parameters that we find in the definition of lateral coherence, which means that in our struggle to improve brightness by improving the geometry, we also got as a bonus coherence, lateral coherence. So that is why coherence is becoming more and more important. Now, 
uh, I will uh, conclude uh, in uh, a couple of minutes and take a break uh, for uh, five or 10 minutes before continuing. I'd like to mention that this process of improving the coherence cannot go on forever. You can understand that by using a brute force approach in which you want to get a small area source. You start with a big area source and you say, well, what I'm going to do is just put a shield with a pinhole. The pinhole is going to be my small area source. Now that's an, not another good way to uh, accomplish this because we are wasting most of the radiation, but it is useful because it allows you to understand what are the limitations in coherence. Because if you are now trying to uh, decrease the size of the source, then you see that as you decrease the size of the source, there is diffraction, which means that uh, the two things are not independent and you find that uh, the uh, minimum value is given by the two parameters, uh, more or less equal to lambda or uh, the, uh, the geometric parameters, the size and the angular divergence, uh, more or less like lambda square. So this is giving you the limitation for the coherent power factor, which corresponds to full spatial coherence. And uh, now some synchrotrons are reaching this limit. Uh, and of course, the new x fans are reaching the limit. I guess uh, uh, we are time for one last question here, or a couple of last questions. First of all, um, a source is a coherent power factor of 0 0.1 for a given wavelength, which is 10 angstroms, can you find out what is the wavelength lambda two for which you reach a coherent power factor of 3.5? And these are the possible answers. Okay, so one angstrom, 0.5 angstrom, two angstroms, or uh, uh, no wavelength. And the polling is running. And... Okay. One, two, three, stop. <laughs> okay. And here are the results. Uh, <laughs> Mixed this basket. It's a good time for a stop because people are clearly going to sleep. <laughs> my, my <laughs> I understand because it may be very late at time for some of them. However, I triggered you because I proposed to go to a coherent power factor that is bigger than the diffraction limit, which is impossible. So the answer is none. All right. OK. So this is the uh, breaking point between the two uh, presentations. Um, I propose to reconvene in about uh, five or six minutes, uh, and uh, uh, my last part is going to be shorter. OK. Thank you. And we'll be back at about um, 9.35 Pacific time. It's a little bit different at your time, Giorgio. Okay, six, uh, it's going to be uh, 6.35 PM uh, Swiss time and Central European time. And God knows what is the time for the others. <laughs> OK. Uh, uh, perhaps as we are taking a break, uh, I can mention uh, that uh, there will be office hours tomorrow. I don't know if uh, uh, you're going to explain about the office hours, uh, uh, Thomas. Um, yeah, I have explained a little bit in emails, but uh, what will happen uh, tomorrow um, after the second um, lecture is that Giorgio and two more speakers, the uh, speakers um, of tomorrow are in parallel available um, on a Zoom meeting. And you can join them, can ask them about their uh, lectures, some more questions about the lectures, um, ask them about their research, maybe their career, Share a hard hot beverage, whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's the purpose is kind of to mimic a little bit the informal interaction you would have if every, everybody was at Slack. OK, uh, let me also mention that, um, of course, you can reach me uh, pretty easily uh, using my email. If you want to have uh, more extended uh, 
interactions uh, uh, you are very welcome uh, so uh, 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 i'm still uh, somewhat confined at home <laughs> so it's very easy to catch me <laughs> There is also um, one more question on the stream. Can you explain the answer to the last quiz question? I think there might be some. Okay, uh, so uh, let me start from the last, last question. Uh, <clears throat> that was a tricky question because uh, I proposed to you uh, an initial value for the uh, 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 coherent power factor, which was uh, below one and therefore uh, it was an allowed value uh, below the uh, uh, diffraction limit. But then I proposed a second value, 3.5, and I asked uh, what is the corresponding wavelength? That was a tricky question because the value is above one. And we learned that the diffraction limit is a, diffraction power, a coherent diffraction power of one. So, I was proposing to you to violate the diffraction limit. The diffraction limit uh, is a, a fundamental property of nature. You cannot uh, overcome the uh, limit by just improving the technology. It is something fundamental. And so the answer is none because uh, no uh, wavelength is going to allow you to break the diffraction limit. Okay. Uh, the question was also about the previous uh, question or, or what? Or, or just I, the last one? I think it was only the last question. That's great. Okay. We still have three minutes to spare. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question in the chat. Um, oh, uh, the one Michelle posted? Yes. Oh, yeah, that's actually from the YouTube channel. Um, and that's probably a little bit disconnected from the point uh, where you were in your lecture. Um, the question is, how are how we are damping the microwaves in the ring? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question because um, uh, we are not, well, the, the spectrum from a bending magnet is very broad, so you're also getting microwaves, but uh, you're getting everything from a bending magnet. You're getting visible radiation, uh, you're getting uh, everything you want. Okay? Uh, however, uh, microwaves are not the main emission of a storage ring, and so they are not creating problems. Um, maybe I can interpret the question, uh, probably th there was uh, the idea that uh, uh, you start uh, from the non-relativistic case and in the non-relativistic case, an ondulator or a bending magnet would emit something uh, in the range of microwaves. However, uh, then we switch to the relativistic case in which the longitudinal uh, speed was close to the speed of light. In this case, uh, the emission is no longer microwaves, but it's X-rays. So you don't, don't need to damp them. Okay. okay. I still have one minute and 10 seconds. <laughs> to rest. <laughs> Just only because I'm giving you. Well, I'm showing. I've been showing the picture a couple of times, so let me show it anyway, okay? <laughs> this is uh, my preferred X-ray free electrolysis in the world. <laughs> no, don't, don't tell the others. <laughs> don't tell the uh, team of uh, uh, Fermi because they may not like it. <laughs> it's a different wavelength range. <laughs> That's a diplomatic way to put it. <laughs> Actually, you know, it's going to be an interesting uh, situation with the European uh, uh, XFL. Okay, but uh, I think that the entire field is moving uh, into uh, a very, very exciting period. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now that we started, uh, let, let me start again. Okay, we introduced the uh, uh, the uh, notion of uh, synchro radiation sources and so on. But this field is not standing still. There are a number of sources that are now coming into the scene. You see some examples here. 
but I would like to concentrate on what is to me the most exciting case that is X-ray free electron lasers. And I think that we should make a note here that is, uh, we learned about the properties of synchrotron radiation. We learned that, that uh, there is collimation, there is high flux, there is coherence. So all these properties uh, <clears throat> remind you of a laser. So the question uh, is uh, if uh, a synchrotron radiation source is a laser. And the answer is no, because the mechanism is not the same. But by now we do have uh, uh, X-ray free electron lasers, uh, which are new things. Uh, and they are closer to a laser, although not, not exact equivalent. So <clears throat> in order to understand how you build a X-ray free electron laser, let me propose to start from the case of a laser for visible light. And these are the ingredients. First of all, you need an active medium because you need the optical amplification. You need an optical cavity because the amplification increases with the path. And so you like the photons to go back and forth. And then you need some kind of pump in order to put in the system the energy that is required to be converted into photons. And as a result, you're going to get an intense collimated, the bright and coherent beam of visible light. Now take the same thing and start asking, how can we build something similar for X-rays? Now there are similarities, but there are differences. First of all, the active medium is not going to be a solid or a, or a liquid or a gas, but it's going to be bunches of free electrons in an accelerator. So we can handle high power without having the damage of the solid or liquid and so on. Second, <clears throat> the source of energy are the free electrons themselves. So you give energy to the free electrons and then they are giving energy to the photons. Last but not least, if you are trying to build an optical cavity, then you have a problem because you cannot get good mirrors for X-rays. Reflection for X-rays is lousy and therefore building a, a optical cavity is not possible, which means that you have to do without, and therefore the uh, optical uh, amplification must be high enough to give you the mechanism without uh, having uh, the back and forth of an optical cavity. Now we can, uh, in this way, get uh, a cultivated, intense, bright, and coherent X-ray beam, which beats by orders of magnitude uh, what you get from a normal synchrotron radiation source. So now let me go to the general scheme for an x -fail. What you need essentially is an accelerator to give you as usual the relativistic electrons. Then you need a wiggler and under certain conditions, you are going to get a laser-like X-ray beam. And so we have to find what are the conditions and what is the mechanism to get optical amplification like in a laser. Now here, uh, <clears throat> I'm taking a revenge from the soccer case before. I mean, the Italian soccer team was doing badly, but there is something of Italian origin that works all the time and that is food. So I'm going to propose to you a delicious Italian salami to explain to you that the uh, optical amplification mechanism in a free electron laser is very much like a salami, okay? What do I mean? Okay, take the uh, wiggler and imagine not a single electron, but a bunch of electrons that are reaching the wiggler. They enter the wiggler and as we have seen before, there start to be emission of uh, waves. Now, from now on, the wave and the electrons are traveling together along the wiggler. And we find there is something funny going on. So because of the interaction between the electrons and the wave, the electron bunch start changing. Instead of having a solid bunch, you start having slices, like in the Italian salami. But this mechanism goes on and on the slices are becoming smaller and smaller or better, thinner and thinner. And so at a certain point, the emission is no longer from all the electrons everywhere in the bunch, from, from electrons that are confined to slices. 
And let's see what's going on. You can see that this emission now is correlated and therefore it gives you an amplification of the initial wave. And so the emission, by the way, is not going to be proportional to the number of electrons, but since the, uh, you combine the amplitudes, uh, it is going to be proportional to the square of the number of electrons. So what is the interaction that uh, is giving you this mechanism? Well, let me tell you that this is uh, a very complicated kind of business. If you want a full theory, then uh, you have to spend a lot of time studying things. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to do that, but I'd like to give you some uh, plausible arguments to see how uh, different kinds of interactions between uh, the electrons and the uh, uh, previously emitted wave give you this kind of uh, slicing. So let me start from uh, the wave with a magnetic field. In second, I'm going to get to the uh, oscillations of the electrons that are caused by the wiggler. And there is a transverse velocity, okay? So now you can put together the B field of the wave and the transverse velocity. This is going to give you a Lorentz force. There it is. And the Lorentz force will push the electrons inside the, 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 the bunch until you get to a point of a zero magnetic field for the wave that is to one of the nodes of the wave. Now you can repeat the uh, analysis uh, for different conditions. So for example, if you take this electron here, you find that uh, you get the velocity, the transverse velocity in the same direction, but the B field is in the opposite direction. So reverse the uh, uh, Lorentz force and therefore you are pushing towards this bunch. And if you repeat that for all the uh, electrons, you discover that there is an accumulation, not at every node, but at every other node, here, not here, here, not here. So the accumulation is going to give you a periodicity of the slices in the accumulation point, which is given by the full wavelength. And so now we discover why the, uh, uh, the, the, the interaction between uh, electrons and the wave are creating this uh, uh, micro bunch structure with the period of the wavelength, okay? Now, uh, before uh, getting into this, uh, let me mention that uh, I, I only gave you a plausibility argument because as I mentioned, the situation is more complex, but if you are looking at the other kinds of interactions, so for example, the electric field of the wave and the electrons, uh, you're getting qualitatively to the same conclusion that is there is an accumulation uh, in the nodes uh, or better in every other node, okay? Now- Giorgio, there yes. are two more questions. Great. Um, the first one is, could you make a ring cavity to have the electron bunch traveling several times through the underlayer? Yes, uh, you can uh, build also uh, free electron lasers uh, by using uh, a, a storage ring. However, uh, there is a subtle difference. That is uh, uh, basically uh, the geometric characteristics of the, uh, 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 of the bunch must be very well controlled and what spreads the uh, dimension of an electron bunch uh, is uh, the emission of synchrotron radiation. The advantage of a LINAC is that the LINAC has no history of previous uh, emission because the electrons are not going around and around and around. They're only going once. And so a LINAC gives you a much cleaner bunch than uh, a storage ring. That is why the x files are typically built using uh, uh, LINAX you build the uh, infrared FELs using storage rings. And another one? Uh, Thomas, I'm not hearing you. Here, um, okay. there, are, there are a few more. I might restrict it to, to two more, otherwise we won't get to the end. Um, do the X-rays produced at the beginning of the Wiggler supply an incoherent background to whatever application the X XFEL was intended for? Uh, okay, uh, strictly speaking, uh, no, because we'll see that the uh, emission, uh, uh, the amplified emission is uh, much stronger. And so the background really is uh, negligible. But there is another effect that we must take into account that we'll uh, discover a little bit later. 
Okay, and uh, a last question, at least for the moment. Why does this not happen in our wigglers in a synchrotron? Okay, that's a very, very good question. And uh, give me a few minutes and I will show you that we'll avoid the second paradox by answering this question. So be patient, okay? Okay, so here we see that uh, thanks to this mechanism of micro branching and optical amplification, we are getting, first of all, a exponential increase in the wave intensity, but this does not go on forever. At a certain point, you get saturation. And uh, let me see how can you explain the exponential increase which actually is pretty simple because uh, basically in the mechanism that we proposed uh, that was based on uh, uh, the uh, Lorentz force, uh, we uh, know that the uh, energy transfer rate is given by a combination of two factors. First of all, what is the transfer rate from the electron to the wave for one single electron. This is what would happen without the micro batching. And then the effect of micro batching. Now these two uh, factors are combined together and we find that the transfer rate is proportional to the electric field of the wave multiplied by the transverse velocity. The micro batching, uh, the, the one that we analyze is proportional to the uh, transverse velocity multiplied by B. Let me say that uh, I already mentioned that this is not the entire mechanism, but we get the same conclusion. And you can see here that the total transfer rate will be proportional to the product of the two fields, B and E, each one proportional to the square root of the intensity. And so the derivative of the intensity with time is proportional to uh, uh, the I, the intensity. And this equation gives you an exponential increase Exponential increase with respect to the time, but the distance is simply given by velocity multiplied by time. So it's pretty easy to understand why there is an exponential like increase. Second question is why we have saturation. Okay, uh, in order to get the optical amplification, we cannot take uh, all the waves because some of the waves are at the right conditions to be amplified, and others are not. So in order to be amplified, we need to transfer energy from the electron to the wave. And this requires a negative work done by the electric field of the wave on the electron. Negative work uh, means that the power, which is uh, E multiplied by the field multiplied by Vt, don't forget that the electron charge is negative and therefore to get a negative work, you must add the two vectors in the same direction. So if uh, the initially emitted wave has this uh, uh, condition, then it can, be, it can be amplified. All the other ways cannot be amplified, okay? So this selects the ways to be amplified. And then the thing goes on. But the problem is that as the electrons give energy to the wave, they lose energy and therefore their uh, speed will decrease. And this condition uh, at a certain point is going to change and actually is going to be reversed. So you're getting to a condition which is exactly the opposite. So the transfer now is from the wave to the electron and not from the electron to the wave. And this thing is going on and on because then you're reversing and reversing, which means that after the first phase of uh, exponential increase, you would get oscillations. Uh, and so you get, uh, you stop before and uh, uh, you saturate the entire mechanism. So this is, uh, these are the two basic ingredients for the increase and the saturation. Okay, and now let's continue our discovery of the important properties. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, we must discover what is the geometry, but also what is the time duration. Um, first of all, we have a bunch of electrons and the geometry that is the area of the source is going to be given by the cross section of this. So we are going back to the same condition we got for a normal wiggler. And second, uh, the bunch length is giving you the duration because if you divide that by the velocity, which is almost the speed of light, then you find what is the duration of this pulse, which is fantastic. Uh, in fact, I mean, uh, I'm almost embarrassed because I'm saying here that it is in the femtosecond range, 
we learned from the first talk that, that now we are talking about atosegments, okay? So we are getting into the entire, uh, excuse me, the entire set of chemistry, okay? And uh, these are fantastic characteristics that make the field electron laser even more attractive. Now, let me go back to the question that was asked before, okay? Why uh, don't you get a free electron laser for every wiggler around the storage window? Actually, this is related to uh, a, a, another question that is uh, free electron lasers were not invented yesterday. They were actually invented 50 years ago or more by a guy called uh, Medi, okay? And uh, he realized the uh, infrared uh, versions of free electron lasers uh, uh, very early, but then we had to wait for decades and decades and decades before uh, getting uh, X-ray free electron lasers. Now that seems like a paradox before, because we are in the micro bunching, we have learned that the periodicity of the micro bunching is given by the wavelength. The wavelength is much shorter for X-rays than for infrared. And so in order to micro bunch in X-ray free electron lasers, you must move the electrons by a distance which is much shorter than for infrared. So why is that? Instead, it is much more difficult to uh, move uh, electrons in an X-ray free electron laser. And it's a subtle point because uh, when you are moving the electrons, you must keep in mind that uh, uh, to get short wavelengths, you need, of course, a large gamma. But when you are seeing what is the uh, mass for this longitudinal motion inside the bunch, that is not the rest mass but it is what is called the relativistic longitudinal mass, which is Einstein telling us the cube of gamma multiplied by M0. Gamma, so the order of 1,000 to 10,000, so these are not uh, really normal electrons. So they are very, very heavy electrons. So they are much heavier than protons, okay? And so, although the distance uh, 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 to, to cover is short, but you have to do that with the small stones that are the uh, uh, electrons with their heavy longitudinal mass. The second point is that uh, precisely because this is uh, a very delicate structure uh, with the short distance and then so on, any kind of perturbation is going to uh, destroy it. So in order to get an X-ray free electron laser, uh, you must go well beyond the technology of normal uh, wigglers uh, because uh, perturbations, uh, defects, problems that would be tolerated for a wiggler uh, would destroy the uh, lazy mechanism in an X-ray free electron laser. So we removed the paradox and I hope we learned why it was so difficult to build X-ray free electron lasers. And thank you to the colleagues that did that. Okay, so question, okay, oops. The period of uh, the wiggler of uh, an X-ray free electron lasers with a gamma of 1,000 is uh, uh, one centimeter. What is a typical value for the number of slices or micro bunches in an electron bunch? This is a slightly more complicated question. It requires a little more calculations. So I'll give this a couple of minutes. Is it is running. Now you can either guess or calculate. And then it was saying the calculation and it takes a couple of steps. Okay, let me stop there because I only have five minutes and 30 seconds left. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are uh, in reasonably good shape. That is uh, the majority is a rarely majority, but it is a majority nevertheless uh, gave the right answer, uh, which is uh, uh, 600, okay? You have to do the calculation essentially by calculating what is the periodicity and therefore taking the wavelength as usual. But then you have to make a guess about the length of uh, a bunch 
And so you had to take femtoseconds uh, multiplied by uh, C and so on. So uh, this is a semi qualitative answer, but this would be the closest one. Okay, we are almost at the end. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I forgot about this one. Uh, so for which value of gamma an electron has a longitudinal relativistic mass equal to the rest mass of a proton? These are the proposed answers. All is running. That's pretty straightforward because uh, all you need is the. Yeah, it seems like. Great. Stop I'm going to end it. Sorry, <laughs> I gave the correct answer already. Uh, <laughs> I tricked you uh, because uh, it turns out that uh, the uh, relativistic longitudinal mass of electrons inside the free electron laser is much, much bigger than the mass of a proton. A proton is only about 2,000 times, 1,800 times more than the mass of an electron. Inside there, you get something which is really heavy, it's bolstered. Great. Okay, ready for the uh, last discoveries. So, coherence. Are we getting coherent sources? The answer is uh, yes or not. Uh, the, the answer is clearly yes for uh, uh, spatial coherence. And you can see here one example. So an FL, an XFL is, uh, uh, has a high level of uh, spatial coherence. Special, I mean, time coherence uh, is a bit different so because in the mechanism that I proposed to you before, we start with the uh, emission of waves from the first electrons that are getting into the weak letter, which is a stochastic process. So it's at random, which means that if you're looking at individual pulses, the shape in time fluctuates, changes a lot from pulse to pulse. And this is pretty bad because if you want to have an experiment with a study or a phenomenon as a function of time, you do not get a good initial time for the phenomenon, which in terms of Fourier theorem means that you have a pretty uh, wide bandwidth. So you would like to have a solution and the solution is what is called seeding. Uh, the seeding means that you do not amplify this uh, initially emitted waves from the same electrons, but you get the waves from another source, you inject the waves into the uh, uh, wiggler, and then this is the way that you amplify. And this is now, as we learned already in the beginning, a reality. So this is the difference between uh, uh, the normal uh, uh, mechanism, which is uh, SASI or self-amplified spontaneous emission in which you emit you emit the waves from the same electron and then you amplify them. In the seeding, you get an external source, you send a wave, travels, is amplified. Okay, and that's one example from Fermi. Uh, it shows that indeed, in this way, you are getting a very narrow bandwidth. Now, I have um, one final question that is now we are getting this gigantic piece these fantastic sources, and they are uh, putting uh, an incredible amount of power, very high brightness and so on. But what can you do with these sources? Because if you send something like that into a molecule or a nanoparticle, this is what you get. So politicians may argue that uh, you have a very expensive way to destroy small things, okay? <laughs> However, one key to the question is that uh, uh, these are femtosecond pulses. Uh, hopefully, you can uh, follow things uh, during the explosion and retrieve what is the initial situation. And that is basically one of the basic ideas about using uh, uh, pulses from a free electron laser. Is one example, uh, and to avoid getting in trouble by making comparisons uh, between uh, the uh, European x fail and uh, uh, Stanford uh, and uh, Fermi, I'm using uh, data that we got from uh, Sakla in Japan. <laughs> yeah, the, this is our individual diffraction pattern get, uh, obtained with pulses for uh, nanobags uh, with or without a drug inside. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the difference. Great. We are at the end. 
And uh, I can only resist mentioning that uh, this field is really getting to a new revolution and the revolution is the new machine that is coming uh, uh, in Stanford, LCLS2. Uh, you've seen already the characteristic, but let me repeat them. There is a high repetition rate and there is excellent stability. The uh, uh, range, the spectral range has been expanded and has been expanded to X -ray, hard X-ray energies up to 25 kilovolts. There are very many things that uh, you can do in order to exploit these characteristics. Just to give an example, in this way, you're reaching the L shells of all elements and the K shells of uh, uh, a good portion of them. Okay, so with this, uh, I would like to thank the people that made uh, the, uh, some of the data available to me, uh, Yuvan Mu and uh, Maya Kiskinova and uh, Primoz Redernik. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of this meeting for this opportunity. It's been very exciting, but above all, you see the kind of fantastic machines you have. So, young folks that are listening, the future, COVID or no COVID, is very bright for you. And I like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Giorgio. And uh, there are still a number of questions. We are, are, are a little bit over time, but uh, we, I think I, I, I would like to convey at least a number of questions and then maybe the questions we can't get to uh, can be answered in your office hour tomorrow. Um, where are we here? Um, how come you don't get the micro-benching effects in undulators at synchrotrons? Uh, the, the question uh, is uh, basically the, the same one of uh, why it is more difficult and so on, okay? It is uh, the micro-benching uh, from a wiggler in a normal synchrotron source, uh, okay, uses wigglers uh, uh, that are technically uh, inferior with respect to the ones that they use in X fails. And so uh, the uh, instabilities, uh, problems, and so on, uh, uh, destroy what is the uh, micro batching structure. Right? So in, uh, the question should be reversed. I mean, uh, what kind of effort uh, should we make in order to get this fantastic microstructure for an X fail? And it is uh, a, a very difficult technology. Thank you. And then another question. Um, the generation of X-ray pulses in synchrotrons and FEL seems to be adequately explained by classical electromagnetics and relativity. Are there any quantum effects that need to be considered? OK, interesting question. And I would say yes or no. OK, let me start from the no. Okay, because basically, uh, when uh, the uh, FL theory was started by Mehdi, he made it a quantum, a quantum theory. And so he's, uh, then he applied for support from the National Science Foundation and from the Department of Energy or whatever it was, the funding agent at that time. And he was refused because people could not understand the quantum theory. And then he realized that you could do that classically. And so you can develop a full classical theory for the free electron laser mechanism, although it is still a complicated theory. However, there is an interesting twist about quantum properties, which was actually pointed out by Joe Storr, okay? And I think that he made a very interesting point, that is basically, okay, when you're looking at coherence, Coherence is a quantum property, okay? You're not uh, been welding with that, that, that aspect, but basically, if you want to use a quantum theory of electromagnetic radiation, then you must get rid of all these notions about the dual nature, waves and photons and so on, because radiation is photons. And so you ask uh, what kind of photon-photon interactions can give you uh, coherence? that is uh, diffraction interference effects. And you find that uh, up until now, it has been primarily not interaction between photons, but interaction of a photon with itself. And uh, 
You understand that because if you are doing the classical Young experiments by sending one photon at a time, then you are getting the uh, interference pattern. However, this is just first order uh, quantum electrodynamics. Uh, can you go to higher orders? The answer is yes for uh, visible radiation. The techniques have been around for a while. Up until now, there's been no for x rays because you don't get enough brightness. But these guys are changing that. And so, sky is the limit for the quantum, uh, uh, ro the, the role of quantum mechanics uh, in uh, x fields. Great. And there might be, yeah, I, I'm going to ask one last question. Does columbic interaction offer any resistance to such bunching mechanism? Uh, uh, not really. I mean, it is a factor that must be included, uh, but uh, it is not uh, preventing uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the formation of uh, these uh, uh, of the micro bunches. You have to take everything into account, and I mentioned that uh, only gave you a plausibility argument with the Lorentz forces. Uh, Really, what you should do is to also include what is called the uh, ponderometric uh, uh, forces, uh, which are coming from the uh, electric field. And when you put everything uh, there, you find that you do get micro -punching. Just, Just wanted to mention that there are many, many thank yous and uh, saying that it was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. In, I in the chat. <laughs> thank you. Yes, and with that, uh, thank you again very much. Um, it uh, was a really delightful talk. Um, and we will see you tomorrow um, in your office hour. Thomas, should I uh, log in into the same uh, uh, site for the office hour? Um, uh, it's a different Zoom link, but I'm going to send you an email. OK, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And for um, all the participants, um, you have now a break. That's a separate Zoom meeting. It's on the Canvas calendar. And we will back for a live webinar then at 10.30. So enjoy your break. <laughs>